The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 4 By Sleigh to Siberia That Christmas there was no tree in our parlor, but my mother did have a new baby in her arms, a little girl she named Alice. Edward had died in three violent days of illness, cut off from the help of a doctor behind that barbed wire. We had seen him fade away. Aunt Lena was gone, too, and all her jolly children. When Uncle Alexander had been taken, she had immediately begun to search, and by a miracle had found where he was imprisoned. If they take him away, I'm going, too, she told us stoutly. She would, too. Aunt Lena was like that. When she left one day, having learned that her husband was to be sent east, we imagined her sitting determinedly at the wheel of her 1912 open car, the back heaped with baggage and children, and following a long line of prisoners as they marched eastward. And so it had been, as we learned later. Equally dramatic was our governess' departure. Olga was engaged to a Russian citizen of German origin. Not wishing to take arms against his ancestral country, he made plans to escape, and excitedly Olga shared the news with my mother. Life here is uncertain for me, too, she said. Who knows how long I'll be allowed to stay? She motioned in the direction of the barbed wire fence. And George, he could never fight against his people, yet he'll surely be sent to the front if he remains here. Then she lowered her voice confidentially. George says that we could take Maria. Never, no, never that. We will not be separated except by force. And that was the end of that. Olga and her George did escape through Turkey and finally to Canada, but I learned that much later. No longer did I play with my little friends across the street. The jagged wires separated us. Soon the factory operations had ceased, too, as men were drafted. Talk at home was somber. My grandmother had come by train from her home in the Caucasus as soon as war had broken out in order to be with us. So she was there in January when my mother received the order that toward the end of the month she and her family must be ready to leave. Leave? To go where? For how long? And with a three-week-old baby? My mother sat stunned in the parlor as they discussed it. Well, the war can't last long, said Grandmother. Three months at the most, and it will all be over, and you'll be back here. I'll go with you, she added brightly. You need help with baby. No, mother said slowly, you should stay. You're better off here, and who knows what the conditions will be. Besides, as you say, we'll be back soon anyway. You must stay. So that cold day in January of 1915, there were just four of us to climb the high steps into the troop-laden train that was to take us where. Never had I cried at the prospect of a train trip, but today my mother was crying, and I cried too. I must have been an object of astonishment, if not amusement, to the soldiers who crowded the train platform. Since our one suitcase was limited mainly to things for the baby, my mother had dressed me in three outfits, one on top of the other. Hurry! Keep up with your brother! Run! Hop up now, fast! Each demand met with the same sluggish response. I felt as if I were ironclad. With a lurch, the wheels were set in motion, and I saw the little railroad station move slowly past the window. Then it was houses, barns, fields, in an ever-increasing blur as we picked up speed. As everything that had been dear and safe and uniquely mine receded into the distance, I shrank from the window to press as close to the folds of my mother's fur coat as I could. One day followed another as we moved eastward. Occasionally we had to change trains, and I would again struggle to get myself and the cumbersome baggage I was wearing from one train to another. Always there were the soldiers. When I ventured too far down the aisle, I heard my mother's sharp call, and she would pull me onto her lap along with the baby and hold me close. Franz was free to come and go as he pleased. Indeed, he considered himself our guardian and especially busied himself in trying to find out where we were going. Certainly it was not to Germany, as we'd at first been told. Now, when my brother made his small excursions up and down the aisle to pick up some bits of news from the soldiers' talk or to question friendly guards, the word was always that we were bound for Siberia. The snow deepened with each passing day, and when we stopped in the middle of nowhere, 
or went very, very slowly, we knew that the drifts were being removed from the tracks. Sometimes we were in deep forests, stretching endlessly, it seemed, a mysterious green barrier between the unknown and my rapidly receding home. With nose pressed to glass, I peopled those far depths with gnomes and fairies and strange, ferocious creatures. Then it was up, up, up into the mountains and the far view on the other side of village after village dotting everywhere the distant snow-swept plain. Occasionally the track lay parallel to a country road, and over the top of the snowbank that separated us I might see a seemingly disembodied horse's head jogging along, wearing the high wooden arch that would in summer and on special occasions be laden with flowers. I knew the harness would have bells, and I wondered if the sleigh the horse was pulling would be painted like ours, and if there were happy children tucked up in warm furs inside, going home or to grandmother's house. One needed an imagination to make life tolerable during those endless days of travel, but my imagination always took me back, never into the unknown future. For a young child, life wasn't so bad on the train, if only my mother didn't so often have tears in her eyes as she looked down at little Alice, or as she drew me close to her. At each stop, my brother took our tea kettle, no Russian traveler in those days would think of going on a journey without one, and joined the line on the railway platform to get boiling water. The tea was distributed inside the train, as were the soldiers' rations, which we also received at the main station stops. At night we climbed up to the net baggage racks above the windows. The improvised hammocks were not unfamiliar to my brother and me. We had often slept in their springy depths when traveling to my grandmother's. It had been an adventure then, especially if one had made a little friend in the next seat, for then one could creep carefully along the netting to the next compartment to whisper and giggle and tell wonderful stories, and if one hung over the edge to watch the scenery go upside down in the moonlight. Then we'd had small down quilts. Here we had none, but in my heavy layers of clothing I slept soundly and dreamed of home. We had been traveling for three weeks when we steamed into Chelyabinsk. It was a fine, large city and also the end of the railroad line, as my mother knew. We'll stay here, she said brightly. It won't be so bad. The war will be over and we'll all go home. Father, too. Of course. We shared mother's cautious optimism as we stepped down from the train and awaited our instructions. Instructions were not forthcoming except for an order to wait. Minutes went by. An hour, two hours. Franz ventured out of the station to pick up some news. Excitedly, he came back. I talked to some men shoveling coal into the engines. They were prisoners, Germans like us. Another big group came through since they arrived and went farther on. Maybe father is with them. With this hope, my mother no longer cared to stay, and when we were at last taken outside the town to join a waiting convoy, she went apprehensively but willingly. What a shock! That the transportation which awaited us would be a sleigh, we didn't doubt. How else could one travel beyond the railroad lines? But this? Stretched out in a long, irregular line in the snow were fifty or more sleighs, each with a huge wicker basket fitted into the scooped-out wooden framework beneath it. From my brother's excited comments, I understood that this must be an iron ore convoy. The baskets carried the black metal, dug from the eastern mines in the summer, to this railroad center in the winter time when the going was easy. Now they were returning, some empty, some filled with supplies, to the mines again, and we were being ordered into an empty one. I took one look at the unsmiling figure beside me and shrank back. The eyes were black and glittering and slanted, and the mustache was as long as the wispy beard like nothing I had ever seen before. From him I looked fearfully back again at the strange monstrosity awaiting me in the snow. How different from our own gaily decorated and fur-lined sleigh. It had had comfortable facing seats, warm rocks on the floor, our own Vanya to drive. My thoughts were cut short as I was hoisted into one of the baskets. Arranging ourselves as best we could, we scarcely had time to wonder at our lack of a driver, 
when the strange caravan got underway. Far away at the head of the column, there was a guide. At the end, there was another, and somewhere in the middle, yet another. That was all. That these baskets were not designed to transport the Zeitner family soon became apparent. The horses were rested and eager to go, and with a first jolting start, I realized that I could never be sure how long Slay, Basket, and Maria would remain together. The containers were designed for the heavy and stable iron ore, not for people, and with every street corner or change of direction, we leaned into the turn, hoping that the dreadful rocking would not upset the basket. The open country wasn't much better, for here the small, white-haired horses tended sometimes to forget that they were to follow the horse ahead of them, and they would lag or meander here and there. We were terrified the first time ours wandered off, though eventually he did come to his senses and made a sudden dash to catch up to his place. More than once that first day, one or another of us tumbled out into the snow from where we looked disconsolately after the receding line of sleighs. In sheer desperation, I soon learned to struggle to my feet and scramble quickly into one of the baskets following, hoping that there would be a stop soon so I could join the rest again. Our mishaps would become more frequent and more frightening when we came to the Ural Mountain Passes. Here the snow quickly obliterated the insignificant roads, and each caravan had to make its own way. Often our sleighs would become separated, and we travel long distances relying solely on the instincts of our horse. These details, however, were as yet mercifully unknown to us when we took our places in the straw-padded baskets on that January morning. Between arranging ourselves and our belongings and trying to anticipate bumps and turns, we reflected fearfully on the journey before us. Mother was unusually quiet, and I, as usual, full of questions. Where are we going? How long will it take to get there? Will we see Father soon? To all my questions, Mother replied in monosyllables, or not at all. At last, Franz whispered angrily in my ear, Be quiet, won't you? She doesn't know. Probably they're going to dump us when we get to the woods and leave us to the wolves. My eyes grew wide with terror, and I opened my mouth to howl, but Franz put his finger on his lips. There was something in his eyes that told me he might have gone a little too far in his dire predictions. I closed my mouth, but sat a little closer to my mother. We had no guard other than our Mongol drivers. They were always civil, and we couldn't complain about that and the guns they carried were not to prevent our escape, but for protection against the wolves that did indeed frequent these parts, and that necessitated our finding lodging well before dark. So I learned that Franz's teasing threat carried more than a little possibility of fulfillment after all. Certain it was that the poor horses were always placed to the rear, so that in case of an attack they would be the ones sacrificed. The fear of finding myself at the end of the convoy as I did on one day of rough travel, was the ultimate terror for me, for I couldn't help but feel that I was a tastier morsel by far than the poor nag which daily plodded in last place. I will never forget my mother's shock on the first night of this strange journey. The Bashkirs of this eastern province were a semi-nomadic tribe, one of those conquered in the 13th century by the Mongol invaders, Arriving at one of their villages, we were welcomed from all sides by the dark, slant-eyed children who ran out to meet us. The log house to which we were led was long and single-gabled, with a narrow end facing the street. Ushered to the door, which was in the middle of the long side, we entered a hall dividing the house down the middle and giving access to the only two rooms of this simple dwelling. The one to the rear was for the women of the household, the one facing the street was for the men. Into this one we were prodded. In the middle of the dark, earthen-floored room, there was a huge pile of rocks, conically arranged and supporting a kettle. Most important of all, whatever was in it smelled good. That was hopeful. Built entirely around the walls was a raised wooden platform, extending to a depth of perhaps five feet into the room. The bedroom, I wondered, it was more than a bedroom, however, for the men hopped onto it nimbly as they entered the room to sit, to mend harnesses, to talk, and to await their dinner. 
Across the hall and to the rear, in quarters arranged in exactly the same style, lived the wives and their children. Of wives, the Mongols might have several, if they could afford them, but always they occupied their own quarters. Because we were prisoners, it soon became obvious to my frightened mother that we and the drivers were to be lodged with the men of the household. Whatever fear I felt was secondary to the sharp hunger pangs, which made me eye the large kettle with eager interest. When its contents of noodles and meat were scooped into a large wooden bowl and placed on the platform, I jumped up with the men, trying to arrange myself cross-legged as they did. My poor mother, never would she sit in such an unladylike position. Poised gingerly on the edge of the bench, she awaited with pained expectancy whatever barbarisms were yet in store. Mother wasn't kept in suspense long. With gusto, the men dipped their fingers into the steaming bowl and began to eat. Anxiously, we children watched the food recede in the pot. My brother was the first to let good sense overcome his fastidiousness, and he reached out a hesitant hand. Ouch! He pulled it out again. He didn't have the calluses these men did. Again he reached in cautiously, and this time drew out a hot morsel. Thereafter, his fingers flew. One of the men, seeing me hesitate, reached over and slapped a choice piece of fat meat into my mouth. It amused him. The steaming globs kept coming until I, too, dared to snatch a fistful and dripping juice all the way, stuff it into my mouth. As for my mother, she ate nothing that night. Later, after listening to the unintelligible gossip of the men lounging on the wooden ledge, we watched as they unrolled the beautifully woven oriental rugs, which in the daytime lay piled against the wall. It was a signal that the kitchen-turned-parlor was about to be transformed into a bedroom. Any fears that Mother might have had about this arrangement were unnecessary, however, and we slept in perfect safety. The days we spent traveling were much the same. The hour-after-hour hour ride in the cramped sleigh, the occasional tumble, the soft sound of hooves in the snow, or their sharp crack on ice, the plumes of steam blowing from the snorting nostrils of fifty horses. Every morning we left while it was still dark. At noon we stopped. While the horses rested and were fed, our guides found a house where we could get food, then on again. One day my mother questioned the leader of the caravan as to our destination. Her look and gestures must have been intelligible because he drew out a letter and waved it at her, Likely it contained his orders, but otherwise she knew no more than before. I shall never forget one crystal clear and bitterly cold night. We had been allowed, as usual, to go into the woods just behind the house before retiring. Softly, from very far away, came the sound of singing. At first faint, it grew in volume and continued in the most beautiful harmony, rising and falling in the night air. In just that haunting minor key, I had heard the Russian choir sing at home, and ecstatically I clutched my mother's hand. I hear girls singing. There must be a Russian village nearby. No, Maria, the voice at my side answered sadly. Those aren't Russian girls. They're jackals. Tears stung my eyes as we returned to the house. We had been on the road about a week when we stopped one day in a village to get our noonday meal. It was a Sunday and dazzlingly clear. While our drivers arranged for food to be prepared, my brother wandered off as usual to explore. As he told it afterwards, he saw walking toward him two men who caught his attention immediately. There was something about them, the cut of their clothes, their walk. Even before seeing their faces, he knew they were Europeans. They turned out to be Germans, and equally surprised to see Franz, whom they questioned eagerly. He in turn asked them if there were more Germans in the town or nearby. Oh, yes, there are quite a few of us. What's your name, by the way? Zeitner, Franz Zeitner. Zeitner? That's a coincidence. That's where we're going, to Zeitner's house. Maybe you're related somehow. What's your father's first name? Max. At the astonished look on the men's faces, my brother must have known. Father? Here? In this very town? In fact, almost directly opposite to where our sleigh had halted? He was bending over a tub, washing clothes. The two men dashed up to the door, calling, Max! Max! Come out! 
There's a family that says they're Zeitners. At the same time, Franz was trying incoherently to tell us what had happened. When my astonished father, rolled up sleeves dripping, appeared in the doorway, speech was impossible, and we fell into each other's arms. That I looked upon this as a miracle of God, I don't remember. It doesn't take a child long to adjust to difficult situations or to wonderful reversals to those situations. I accepted my father's presence as right and natural, and only later began to fully appreciate what God had wrought for us. From the happy bedlam of conversation, I learned that father had been here several months already, had even acquired a house. There were quite a number of Germans in this place, as my brother had been told, as well as other nationalities. Among them were my uncle Sasha and the indomitable Aunt Lena and their children. The car lay abandoned somewhere back beyond the mountains and forests and ice, but that didn't matter. She was here. For news of Uncle Otto, we had to wait until 1920. One must understand that banishment to Siberia was something entirely different from imprisonment. These aliens, of whom we were a part, had been sent north to be politically neutralized. Here they could do no harm by engaging in anti-Russian war activity. Neither could they easily escape back across the frozen wastes. There had been no guard here in this village of Taj Bulatova and the newly planted community had been left free to take up life as best it could, with only an occasional inspection by a passing official. Now my father was faced with a task of persuading the guide to leave his newly found family there. When the leader of the caravan returned to conduct us to the eating place he'd found, he was besieged by a large and vociferous crowd headed up by my father. By gestures and the little Bashkirin that he had already picked up, plus the enticement of whatever coins and jewelry could be collected from among those standing there, my father bargained. To the Mongols, it didn't seem unnatural that he should be buying a wife. They obtained theirs in the same manner. But a wife with three children already? And the leader of the caravan did have that letter. The glittering eyes narrowed. Greed, a profitable way out of the responsibility for our care. Surely the intervention of God all combined to cause him at last to tear up the letter, snatch the proffered payment, and stride away, pocketing his newfound wealth. How he explained all this, I don't know. Perhaps he said the wolves had gotten us. Not an unlikely possibility. Perhaps he was never questioned. There were more urgent matters during those war years than keeping track of a woman and three young children. Whatever the explanation, the glorious fact for us was that we had been reunited. Having already lived a week among the Bashkirs, I needed no imagination to know what my new home would be like. Periodically, the Mongols abandoned their vermin-infested dwellings and built anew, and my father had been the happy recipient of one of those no longer habitable by Bashkir standards. But home it was, for weren't we all together? That evening passed as in a dream. First there were prayers of thanksgiving as we sat on the hard, bare ledge of our earthen-floored cabin. Then there was little Alice, whom my father had never seen, to fondle and admire. It seemed a miracle that she was there, after such a perilous journey, when the two babies preceding her had died in spite of all the care and comfort of our Urbach home. Next in order was the removal of the dirt. We were filthy with the contents of every meal to be read on faces, bodies, and clothes. The talk couldn't wait, though, and between what seemed unnecessarily savage attacks at dirt, encrusted ears, face, and arms, I heard snatches of conversation. I learned that there were three families here besides ours and Uncle Sasha's. Then there was a widower and his already grown children. The rest were all single men, engineers, and professional men, many from Germany and some from England. There were sixty in all, scattered in various dwellings in the village and the surrounding forest. At first the people had been hostile to the intrusion, but as always the children had made the first overtures, and there was now a friendly attitude toward the adults as well. And so I drifted off at last, rosy and clean, on the makeshift bed which had been prepared on the ledge, to the comforting sound of my parents' voices, recounting the events, both wonderful and sad, 
which had brought us all together here. Somehow my mother created a home for us in that wilderness place. There was no way we could become self-sufficient as the Bashkirs were, but in return for services of various kinds, we received the few necessities we could not find for ourselves. Our men also learned to carve and sell the little wooden bowls from which the people drank their kumits, the fermented horse milk that we too learned to drink. The bowls were painted and lacquered and to me seemed beautiful in our bare house. Other utensils were also fashioned, so we never needed to become adept at fishing our food from the pot by hand. Food was, of course, the major concern. The Bashkirs ate no vegetables, and during the first winter we suffered from this lack in our diet. With the coming of summer, however, my mother taught us what was edible in the fields, and my brother and I gathered vegetables. Wild fruits we picked from the trees and dried for the winter. Berries grew plentifully, too, in the rich, dark soil. Immense and succulent strawberries and blueberries. What we really missed was meat, and the wheat cooked with a little salt and oil didn't satisfy me. One day, when we'd been there for some months, I was allowed to go home with a little Mongol friend to eat with her family. I was quite excited to be so honored, and even more excited when I saw the noodles with the big chunks of meat floating in the pot. When I told my mother later what I'd had, she was pleased for my sake. It was horse meat, and it tasted so good, I volunteered eagerly. My mother became angry, and that night there was no good night kiss. In time, however, she ate it too, for being Mohammedans, the Bashkirs ate nothing but lamb or horse meat. Later, when father had befriended the Russian police who occasionally came through to check on our village, and no doubt more particularly on us, he got permission to go to outlying Cossack villages and butcher for the farmers. In return, he brought back food, including, of course, some of the sausages which followed the butchering. Milk was plentiful, but here again I got into trouble. In the evening, when the cows had come home from pasture to be milked, I always took our wooden pail to where the women boiled the milk in a great iron kettle. I watched it as it bubbled on top and sometimes smelled it, too, when it scorched. Before it was poured into my bucket, one of the women presiding over the pot would tear out a few strands of her black hair, and after rolling it into a greasy ball, throw it into the boiling liquid. It was quite a while before I got around to mentioning this odd behavior to Mother, and when I did, the reaction was as one can imagine. That night the milk was boiled again and really scorched. Next day the mystery was solved, when my father learned that the custom had something to do with chasing away the bad spirits in the milk. Hunting for bird's eggs was more fun than work for France and me, and we quickly learned which ones were the tastiest. Mushrooms were to be found also and were selected with care. While it was still winter, father learned to fish in the frozen lake. Like the natives, he made two holes in the ice at quite a distance from each other. In one hole he dropped a net, and through the other he let down a long hook with which he caught the net and drew it slowly through the water to the second hole. The resulting catch gave us many a meal. The irregular surveillance finally stopped entirely, so that sometimes a group of men could borrow a sleigh and some of the many horses which roamed free and travel the several days' journey to Verkizilsk. Here, since manpower was scarce due to the war, the men were able to work a little, and bring back some wonderful treats like potatoes and meat. We lived among the Bashkirs for more than a year, and during that time we learned much from them that kept us alive. But they learned something from us as well. The Bashkirs never washed their clothing. It was worn until it fell off. My mother showed them that it would last longer if washed, and that it smelled better too. She made soap and invited them to watch a wash day demonstration. As a result, there occurred a summertime activity that had never been seen in those parts before. The Mongol women kneeling at the lakeside, washing their husbands' wide, cinched-in trousers and their own colorful tunics and jackets. The long, braided black hair that had never known a comb was also washed and smoothed with crudely made instruments. Only the bib which every married woman wore wasn't washed, for onto it was sown the family wealth 
in the form of gold and silver coins. Of course, my brother's formal education came to a standstill. Mine had never begun, but father had managed to bring with him a New Testament, the book that was to be our only text for years to come. Snow and sand served as my writing tablet, and a finger or stick as pencil. For the rest, inventiveness must suffice, so that we children even had occasional fun during that year. For Franz and me, it was wonderful to have our cousins with us. There were Olga and Minna, too small to be of much use, but Victor was one year younger than I and had been one of my favorites in Urbach. Here his father organized and taught a Sunday school for us children. He had a knack for handling children, quite different from my authoritarian father, and Victor declared that he too would become a pastor one day. He would gather us in front of him, recruiting the younger ones as well, mount a rock, and begin to preach. For me, his prayers were always too long, and my attention would waver to woods and fields. Sister Maria, are you not praying? Close your eyes, came from the pulpit. With great effort, I squeezed them shut again, while Victor continued his interminable prayer. At Christmas, Uncle Sasha wrote a wonderful play for us. Franz was St. Nicholas, and I remember one of the lines that my dear wise uncle had put in for him. Santa told us that his helpers were on strike and couldn't prepare any gifts, but we should turn the tables and give our parents the nicest gift and one which no money could buy, our love and obedience. I will never forget the proud and happy glow which that thought lit in my heart on Christmas Day in that far-off land. Whether I did give that gift, I can't say, but I wanted to very, very much. Not only were there plays in Sunday school, but ball games were organized. The balls certainly weren't what a present-day little leaguer would imagine. Ours were molded out of cow hair mixed with flour and water and left to dry in the sun. Needless to say, they didn't bounce nor did one strike them with bat or shoe, but they were fine for playing catch. The men managed to make skates for us as well. Crude affairs, it is true, fashioned from a flat piece of wood and a strip of metal, but they gave some semblance of scraping, if not gliding, over the frozen lake. Around Easter, when the snow was still deep, my brother and I would climb the nearby hill to hunt for snow tulips, sinking at each step to our knees. In the more shallow places we looked for the little holes, where the gentle heat of the thrusting plant had melted an opening in the snow. Then plunging a hand deep into its wintry greenhouse, one could pluck up a perfect bloom in red or white or yellow. An offering of these gaily bright flowers never failed to bring a smile to my mother's eyes, and so I like to think that she was sometimes happy too.